Hello and welcome to the VIP show. My name is James Taylor, keynote speaker on creativity, innovation and artificial intelligence. And I'm Alison Burns, the ethical futurist, exploring everything ethical in the future. So there you go. <laughs> and uh, with this show, every week we get together and we're just going to share, it's called the VIP show and the I in the VIP stands for interesting. So each week we're going to share an interesting business or company, an interesting person and an interesting thing, just to kind of brighten up uh, your week. So first of all, how's your week been? How's it been going? I was just about to ask you the same question. My week has been okay. Yeah, um, nurturing, nurturing my brain cells, Good. learning exciting. some some things, uh, playing piano, which is nice. Yeah, I felt this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, um, at one point this morning, I said, "Oh, do you know what? I, I could really do with today is going to a nice spa. Well, let's a do nice, that. Nice warm. Go to a nice spa, get a Turkish sauna or something like that. Yeah. And then I suddenly <laughs> realized we're in the middle of a global pandemic, and that's not going to happen for a while. That'll so be the bathroom, um, yeah. <laughs> So regardless of where you're joining us from, welcome to leave your comments in below. Let us know uh, as we're going kind of through this, what your own experiences are with some of these things. So let's go to our very first, uh, this is our very interesting company or business of the week. Yeah. And when we say interesting, we don't always mean interesting in a positive or a good way. It can also be interesting in something that we find or else might be ethical, ch ethically challenging. So uh, as a little kind of segue into this, let me show you this. This is, um, I just saw this this week. This is uh, oh, wrong, wrong one. Um, this is a company that uh, here we go. Here we go. Indonesia is vaccinating its influencers oh. first. Mm. So they're rolling out the vaccine in different countries, and whereas most countries are going from their more at-risk population first, and elderly, those at risk, existing health conditions, and then going down from there. Indonesia has chosen, chosen a slightly different tax. So they're actually going the opposite way. They're vaccinating their younger people first and then kind of going up and mm. they're actually bringing in, in uh, kind of influencers because they want more of the young people to be vaccinated. So there's obviously an ethical thing for that. But the bigger mm. thing I'm seeing, and I think this is going to be a real trend. It's a very interesting trend. Good or bad, we'll, we'll maybe have a chat about. And it's this. Mm. This is how the super rich are beating you to the vaccine. Uh, this is a company, uh, there's a number of companies now. This is Knightsbridge, uh, is the Knight, company. Knightsbridge, Circle. Knightsbridge Circle. This is like a, a concierge or private member service. It's like a, a personal manager. Service. Yeah, and so like in this case, 25,000 pounds a year, about $30,000. You pay them and you get like a personal manager. So if suddenly you want a bottle of Glen Morangy whiskey and you're in an In the middle of the night. Yeah, they'll bring it to you. But one of the things that the service they're providing to these very wealthy people is a vaccination service. So they will fly you and your family to on a private jet. They'll pick you up. They'll pick you up a private jet. They'll fly you to a country. There's a number of different countries that are doing this. And you will be vaccinated at a private clinic. You will get the COVID-19 mm. vaccine. You don't necessarily say which of the vaccines, obviously, these different types. And then you'll stay in this wonderful villa, I'm told. Uh, the article shows us uh, actually an article from Vice magazine. Uh, it's also been featured in the Daily Telegraph in the UK as well. And then after about 28 days, then you get the second vaccine mm. and then they pick you up and, and then you fly you home and you get wine dined and everything while you're there, I guess. But I thought the thing I was uh, I want to talk to you about being the ethical futurist is one of the things that they said was I have to, this, this is their, I think their CEO, uh, Mr. McNeil. He said, I have to weigh up the unbalance between making lots of money and being mm -hmm. able to sleep at night. Uh, to, I'm not going to give the vaccine for a 35 year old uh, who, go, who wants to go to the gym. So, thoughts? Well, if you think about it this way, you actually, you know, in terms of saving, how many lives can you save by by vaccinating the frontline health workers, health workers and carers? First of all, and also protecting the most vulnerable in mm. in the community in in world the global communities. Plus, if you take, you know, if you just because you've got money, also this is this is to do with connections, because a lot of these people who are wealthy, they're also well connected. So, you know, this can all be done under the radar. No one really knows about it. So you can it's, it's your kind of dirty little secret. But how many people does that deprive of? The, the really need it, who yeah. really are vulnerable. Um, 
you know, so that I'm not comfortable with it with it at all. Actually, but, but I thought what I thought was interesting. I mean, it's kind of an interesting topic about uh, vaccine tourism, which I think you're going to see. Yeah. Um, I think the countries are starting to do it first. The countries which are known for medical tourism, anyway. But uh, the the founder of this company, Next Bridge Circle, he was making an ethical distinction. He said, yeah. "It's fine if people want to jump the queue and pay lots of money. He doesn't have an ethical problem with that. What he has an ethical problem is the age group." of those people so he'd be fine about taking money from a 65 year old billionaire but he wouldn't take money from a 35 who is still jumping the queue or just, possibly they're, still they're all jumping, jumping the queue, jumping the queue. In, exactly. in, in, especially in, in, a, in a country like no country has 100 because why would you because why would you why would you do that why would you go and pay for a vaccine and be a, a vaccine tourist if you can actually legitimately and properly in the queue um, take your turn in, in your own home country. Yeah. So it, it's, it's jumping the queue. I mean, I, you want to get a vaccine, you want to get vaccinated, but you also want people to, to be protected within your community and the wider community. It's, it's, it's not really, doesn't sit comfortably yeah. with, with me at all. And um, So if you're watching this just now, what, what, mm. uh, on the comments section, what are your take? Just leave in the comments uh, just below here. Um, what do you think? Would you, if this was offered to you, would you take this? If you, you have the service, maybe you can have the service and you're thinking about it just now, you're investigating this as an option for you and your family. Is this something that you would do? And uh, if not, why, what is it that's maybe kind of holding you back from doing this? I think this is interesting. I'm, I saw someone tweeting today someone is quite a well-known influencer who had just had the vaccine. Mm. And I, I did have to ask the question, well, how did they manage to get this vaccine? Because they're, they're younger than me. Um, and I was, you kind of, you start to ask questions when people, some people were getting the vaccine or not. Well, it's like you were talking about earlier, influencers in Indonesia um, being given the vaccine first. Yeah. And that's to promote younger people, to encourage younger people to, to actually to take the vaccine. But what's been done to encourage older people who are maybe not yeah. so social social media savvy so what it's all very well putting your focus on the younger people because it's easy to communicate through social media but what's happening to encourage the older generations who actually need it they're more vulnerable i guess when we, so, when we hear that word influence we think like social media influences, I know, but i guess I know. in the uk it's where we are filming this from you have the queen i guess she's an influencer, she's an influencer. She <laughs> so, she's, uh, she's like, it's like the term she's an influencer and so, so she's uh, I don't think they had video of her getting the jab, but she made no, it public no. that she was get she got the vaccine. So interesting. So watch this space. Keep an eye out on this about this whole idea of vaccine tourism. So that's our very interesting business mm -hmm. or company of the week. Uh, let's talk about our very interesting person of the week. I'm going to put this up just now. I'll let you kind of explain what it's all about. Okay. Well, this is news because um, it's the first vegan restaurant in France to get a Michelin star. And this is a very interesting, it's called Ona, I think that's the pronunciation, Ona Vegan. And this is a, a vegan restaurant in Bordeaux or near Bordeaux. Um, and um, this, the the lady who started, this is Claire Valet, um, she started this business. She was actually inspired after a trip to Thailand to become vegan because there's a fantastic amount of vegan restaurants and great food and great honest food um, in uh, Thailand for vegans, as we know. And uh, so she came back, she was inspired, but she's actually, she's not a, she's not trained as a chef. She's actually an archaeologist. No. And um, so she's got quite an interesting background. But anyway, so she, this this was a project of hers, but she'd gone to various banks for loans to, to start this business because she was totally inspired. And um, she was refused quite a lot of lo loans to start a business. So she did a crowdfunding campaign and she actually raised 10,000 euros and um, and tried to supplement that with other loans, but she was turned down again. And But then she found an ethical bank, managed to get a loan, and obviously on the back of the crowdfunding, and a patron or two, I think. So she had some patrons involved. And so she actually got the keys to her business in uh, August 20, let me just get that, 2016. So this is a That's fairly new... Well, yeah, to go from, from zero to Michelin star... Within like four years... And not be a trained chef. Exactly. That is pretty amazing. So it's pretty it's pretty good going. But but actually in August 2016, when she got the keys to her premises, and um, I think you've got a picture of it there as yeah. well that you've seen, she, uh, 
there was obviously there's more work in the kit now and the and all the you know setting up a restaurant and so it's a massive and and kitting out the whole restaurant. So she actually started what, what was called she had a great a great idea a participatory workshop okay. work site. So she had volunteers like painters, decorators, electricians, plumbers, and they all volunteered to get this project off the ground. It was amazing. So that was right. all. That's like local, yeah, local participation. Everyone just chipping in. Yeah, everyone just getting involved and saying, "This is we believe in this project." But even even her um, crowdfunding, there was something like 126 countries. So anyone who knows about this about this restaurant now, you say, "Well, the next time I'm in Bordeaux, we're definitely going to go yeah. there because this sounds amazing." But she's just because she's an archaeologist. I mean, I had a look on her website and it's and it's lovely. It's a really well laid out. But I dug a bit deeper into the into the menus, and obviously we, when we go there, we're going to eat everything in sight. But her, her menus are like works of art. It's incredible. <laughs> These are great. So I know. It's, 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 look at that. It's, I mean, usually more menus are pretty boring. This pretty, is her scoping out and you no know, thinking about how's how's what what is the food going to be presented like? Yeah. What's on the plate? And they're like works of art. There's, it's like an architect's it's like, plan. It reminds me of like those kind of Michelangelo drawings exactly. when you're sketching out yeah. um, uh, a design yeah. for a bridge or something. Really creative. Yeah. But then that's a creative mind at work. And that's I just find that fascinating. That's just one of the menus that she has. But even just look at the menus, I just thought I was fascinated by the drawings yeah. themselves. But but it also reminds me of um, a restaurant that we went to in the south of France, we were regulars for various conferences in uh, in Cannes. So we, we, on one of our occasions, this was going back a good few years, we went to a restaurant near Nice, so it's kind of west of Nice, in the hills, and it's called La Colombe d'Or. Yeah. And it's, that's got a fascinating history as well. This yeah, that's, that's one like that. What did you call that workshop, that workspace, like a... Participatory, participatory work, work so, site. So I, I guess like Colin Dore did it before anyone else did. This is, I'm putting a picture up just now. So this was when the, in the early days of this, it was a kind of coaching in slash restaurant, great, great food. And it was very popular by lots of artists at the time. So people like Picasso would go and stay there. Mm. And the owner at the time, what you would do is you say, rather than you can get free bed and board here, and we'll give mm -hmm. you food and everything, but just create me a painting yeah. or design me a sculpture or create some piece of art that we can hang on the walls. And what's great, if you get a chance to go there, it's called La Column d'Or and it's just outside of, of Cannes. It's, 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 it's kind of west of Nice and up in the hills. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful landscape yeah. where it's, it's nestled into some lovely um, and when greenery. You, and when you go there, it's kind of amazing because normally when you go to like a, a gallery or an art gallery or museum, the art, like the Picasso paintings, you know, it's got a big screen behind a screen and it's, you know, there's a lot of security. But you could be sitting, tucking into your soup and right next to you is a Picasso. Or, I mean, and there's lots of other great artists mm. as well. So this kind of idea of participatory... Yeah. And also this, work. this, this, the column door kind of shaped its, its future. It started off as a cafe and then it had some rooms. But it actually shaped its future in around about 1940 where it, it was declared... That area, the Côte d'Azur, was was declared a free zone. So mm. it was artists and and thinkers, a variety of, of artists and thinkers, would flock to that area because it was a place where they can be continue to be creative in their thinking and in their art. Mm. And you know, that's the middle of World War Two, And um, so it, it was called a free zone. I'm not exactly sure what the free zone mm means but it's not like they like the taxes but maybe it was yeah. like free no i think it was in terms of being able to be liberal liberty or yeah exactly right. so um but they, but they flocked there and there's an interesting story as well to do with the the, the fireplace which we've actually seen it. we've sat by the fireplace and it was designed it was like there was lots of additions to the la column door over time but this this an architect so yet another architect had uh, designed this fireplace but everyone who participated in the fireplace, the building of the fireplace, laid a hand in the wet cement. Oh, so wow. the so the handprints. So it's like it's yeah. like the um, you know, like the Hollywood stars, you know, all that stuff. So the handprints, the handprints hand of the people the hands who of the actually artists. actually are embedded there for all time. Yeah, I find that fascinating. But what I find that that kind of ties in. Obviously, you talk about ethics being an ethical yeah. future. I talk about creativity. Um, and places like this are really important. Uh, there was a there was an article this week. I think it was in the Financial Times. It was the Financial Times of the Economist, talking about a lot of CEOs are getting really worried just now. They're seeing a creativity crisis because 
virtual is great and we're doing this online just now obviously but uh people need to kind of be together they need to break bread together and mm. and that could be artists people from different backgrounds your peers kind of random thoughts that's how the ideas can literally need to bump into each other and i think a column door in creativity research we would call this a third place mm-hmm. so it's somewhere that's not your home and it's not your work it's a kind of middle place and if you look at any of the history of creativity the ancient Athens, they would have the symposiums, which just mm. means to drink together, if the Greek word to drink together, symposium. And we'd get together with different people, merchants, philosophers, artists, politicians, and they would debate and discuss the ideas of the time. Mm. More recently, you have like the coffee shops. They kind of fulfill that function in the 1920s. If you went to Paris in the 20s or 30s, the, the wine bars, the coffee shops. And I think somewhere like this, um, and, and it sounds like, and I hope this, the, the place you mentioned, this new vegan place in, in um, Bordeaux has that ability. And it'd be interesting to see some restaurants have, you know, you have a table and it's a table for four, but I'm seeing a lot more restaurants have more longer tables. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you just end up sitting next to someone, you have no idea who they are. I mean, some people don't like this, but some of it'd be quite interesting because you sit next to and have a conversation. What do you do? Well, it's different chats, isn't it? It's yeah. different chat because if you don't have, if you're not able to bump it, you know, that's why art and music, exactly. We don't see borders. We just see, like, open. you want to be open to conversation yeah. and new ideas. And and you don't want those those kind of external limitations on things. So that's why it's really important for creatives that they've got space or to be creative mm-hmm. or just to get new ideas. And it doesn't necessarily have to be two sets of creative people coming together it could be you know you could be talking to another someone from completely another discipline altogether yeah you know there's there's the um claire valley for the from the the restaurant in bordeaux uh ona uh, she's from an, an architecture you know discipline mm. but with that creative slant and a passion for food it's just amazing you, now she's created something amazing and it's actually yeah but obviously, she's the, she's the figurehead yeah. of this place. But if you think about it, that restaurant, you know, who created it? Is it the is it clear? You know, she's mm. she's part of that creation process. Is the instigator of the idea. But then her, there's her chefs. There's a front of house mm. people. There are the the builders, the joiners, the painters. Well, they all have a stake. In they it. all have a stake. Mm. They're all kind of essentially co-creating that place, and that's what makes it, it really interesting. Yeah. And hopefully, as we start to come together again, you're going to see a lot more of this kind of co-creation and, they, and the, collaboration. The crowd funders as well. Everyone who who invested in it, who believed in it, which is yeah. really important. So give everyone the name of the place again, just so they can go and check it it's, out online. It's uh, Ona, which is O N A O N A, and it's in uh, it's near Bo- it's in Bordeaux. And I can't remember the name. Is it R? Uh, and it's the first vegan Aris, restaurant Aris. in France to attain a Michelin star. There's been Straight other news. vegan restaurants that have had Michelin stars. So it's the very first one in, in France. And France has traditionally not been a place you think of for vegan food, but it's actually it's great seeing that the, the plant-based and the vegan culture really mm. expanding there. Mm. So that's our very interesting person of the week. So Can't wait to go there. Clear. We look forward to going there. Um, and let's talk about our very interesting thing. Of the week as we start to oh, finish do you want up. To, yeah, do you want to speak about it just now? Yeah. So we're in we're filming this today from Scotland and it's really cold. It's, it's really, really it's cold. I've been glued we've got an aga because we don't have we don't have gas, you know, uh, utilities, but we have we're oil fired, which is because we're up in the in the hills, but we have a an oil fired aga. And um I've have been glued to it for about three days. It's been freezing. So one one of the things, like as as we start to, and this is actually something that we got before the lockdown happened, mm-hmm. and we invested in this, and it's it's not inexpensive. But it's not super expensive, and a lot of homes are now getting it. Is um is this system here? It's called uh, Hive. It's an active heating system. Now it means uh, essentially it means it connects mm-hmm. your your water your heating system, water heating system, the boilers to an ele- electronic system which is a kind of IoT, Internet of Things. Now, what's great about it, it means you could be sitting in a different room, and if you want the heating on, it's a bit cold, just hit the heating on. Maybe you want to go and have a shower or bath in an hour's time, just you know, switch it on. We used to use it a lot, I probably even maybe more when we were, if we were traveling, and yeah. we would arrive at an airport, we'd arrive home, and it was maybe 45 minutes from the, the airport to the house, so we would just, put on the heating and put the hot water on yeah. so everything would be ready for us. And it was amazing because you'd be sitting, we'd be sitting on a plane, 35,000 feet in the air. Let's have a look. See, we'll see what the temperature's like at the house yeah. just now. And it's, it kind of feels like the stuff of fantasy. I know everyone gets really excited about 
you know, going to <laughs> Mars and all that kind of stuff. No, I just want to go to a warm house. Yeah, but, just, but sometimes it's like simpler technologies that can be the most transformative as well. So, well, they absolutely are. But the amount I can count the, every single time coming back from a, a trip, or it could be touring somewhere or you're doing a, a presentation somewhere. And um, we just didn't know. And or, or when we were abroad and living in America, we were keeping an eye on the house, we would never know the temperature of the house. So you'd have to have people to go go in and look after things. But, but in an instant, you can look on the app and say, oh, the temperature in the house is this. Mm. So let's just give it a boost. And also as well, it, it makes for a very efficient yeah. um, usage of fuel because you don't want to have the heat on full pelt and um, it's not necessary. So you can just keep things ticking over at a... A, you know, a, a, like a frost free setting or whatever, but it's a great app. You do the water and the, and you, yeah. can, you can talk to it through Alexa. Yeah, you can talk to it to like Alexa and other things. And in fact, this is the one we use is called Hive, but, uh, mm -hmm. which has just been acquired by Google. And there are some, there's some concerns around that from a, oh, a, data, kind of, a data perspective, Google okay. and like, but um, there are other ones, there are other ones on the market. And some of the other ones also use a lot more machine learning in them. So that they kind of get to recognize. Maybe on Sundays you get up a little bit later on a Sunday, and so the heating will go a little bit later. And it well, just, we've got a television like that. Yeah, it seems to, I don't know. There's something alien. It recognizes. It recognizes when we switch the TV on for the news, and it's suddenly it's just starting to. I think that's. A, I think that's a design fault. <laughs> I, I don't think it's been very smart. <laughs> so that's our Hive. It's called Hive Active Heating System. Go and check it out if you're thinking maybe of upgrading your system or just trying to get a little bit more, you know, be a bit more environmentally friendly. And ways to reduce your um, energy and be more efficient with your energy costs. So that's our um, our VIP show. Another yeah. week. This is episode. This is episode number three. Wow. So if you've been looking, looking in, staying with us, thank you so much for that. We've got we've got um, a few viewers and. Uh, and we're just going to build it from here. Yeah. So this is an experiment. Every week we're trying a couple of new little, little things, seeing the getting the format uh, like tweaked and dialed in a little bit. So thanks so much for joining us. Please leave any comments uh, below wherever you're watching this from. You might be watching on uh, Twitter. You might go and follow Alison at Alison Burns Jazz, which is on Twitter. You might be following it in LinkedIn, in which case just go to look at James Taylor, a keynote speaker, and uh, you can follow along there. Or maybe you're watching live just now or pre-recorded on uh, YouTube. So thanks so much for watching. Yeah, thank you so much. And we'll see you again next week. Next week, uh, for another week. Who knows what it's going to be like next week? I wonder what's you know, going to happen. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. <laughs> thanks for watching, everyone. My name is James Taylor, keynote speaker on creativity, innovation, and artificial intelligence. And I'm Alison Burns. <laughs> I forgot who I was here. I am ethical futurist looking at all things ethical along the way.